I've been reading some non-fiction over the last couple of weeks, um, and uh, they're kind of populist history books, I guess, but um, uh, the three of them in their own way, well, one of them is in popular history, um, and we'll get to that at the end. But um, uh, they've been fascinating and have been written <laughs> with such kind of wit and verve that they are as much a delight to read as they are filling in quite a few gaps um, around my knowledge. Um, the first one is Evening in the Palace of Reason, Bark meets Frederick the Great in the Age of Enlightenment. It's a slightly misleading title um, in the sense that Bach and Frederick the Great met only once towards the end of Bach's life. Um, and really the book is a kind of potted parallel history of, of Bach and Frederick the Great, even though they were slightly asynchronous in their life. But it takes Bach as a, uh, as a kind of symbol of the kind of mystical possibilities of, of, of music that has a that is sort of underpinned by kind of logic. Um, given he wrote fugues and canons, which are you know have, have very strict rules, uh, musical rules, and Frederick the Great is seen as one of those more enlightened despots. Um, and clearly he wasn't quite as enlightened as some people think he was. I mean, he did do quite a lot for society um, that feels quite modern, but essentially he was mostly at war. Um, and that's where he kind of preferred to be. But, um, and C.P.E. Bach went off and, and, and became his court composer. Um, and so the, the kind of moment this book hinges on is Bach later in late in life went to see or meet Frederick the Great um, and his son and was um, presented with a theme it's called the royal theme and essentially it was a complex complicated melodic figure that we don't know who wrote it Frederick the Great could have written it but it's unlikely. More likely it was C.P. Bach, um, who was essentially trying to do one over on his dad. Um, and it was so constructed as to be very difficult to create a fugue from it. And the great piece of writing called The Musical Offering that Bach wrote was essentially showing his son and Frederick the Great that he could write fugues based on anything. Um, I would take issue with that. I mean, I love Bach. I love Bach deeply. Um, I probably own more Bach than I do Beethoven, who I love really deeply. Um, but there's the, 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 the great little issue or problem, the knot in this, the royal theme, is the fourth bar, which is a dissenting chromatic, the chromatic scale, so all the notes of the scale. Um, leaving no kind of room um, for variation. And if you listen to all, all the, the, the writing in the Royal Offering, all the orchestral writing um, uh, and instrumental writing, you always hear that bar as being unmusical um, or lacking something. And so he was, you know, Bach was slightly undone by that very... Um, difficult and purposefully difficult um, bar. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's kind of what it hinges on. But actually, it's the life of Bach and it's the life of Frederick the Great. And I know quite a lot about Bach, so that was just kind of interesting just because it's always nice to kind of get another view on a life you know. But I didn't know anything about Frederick the Great. And my God, was his father a bastard. I mean, his father was just the most unpleasant, vindictive slightly insane man who actually m made the imprisoned his son with the threat of execution but before he did that he made his guards press his son's face up against the prison window to watch his friend be executed and that's going to fuck anyone up and whatever issues um Frederick had afterwards uh, may well stem from his father. But I'm going to read the first paragraph of the book because it gives you an idea of just just kind of how witty the book is. Um, 
Right. Um, Frederick the Great had always loved to play the flute, which was one of the qualities in him that his father most despised. Throughout his youth, Frederick had to play in secret. Among his fondest memories were evenings at his mother's palace, where he was free to dress up in French clothes, curl and puff his hair in the French style, and play duets with his soulmate sister, Wilhelmina. He on the flute he called Princip um, Principa, she on her lute, Principessa. Um, when Frederick's father once happened unexpectedly on the scene, he flew into a rage. Even more than his son's flute playing, Frederick William the first hated everything French. French clothes, French food, French mannerisms, French civilization, all of which he dismissed as effeminate. He had, of course, been educated in French, like most German princes. He could not even spell Deutschland, but habitually wrote Deutschland, so he had to speak French, but he hated himself for it. He dressed convicts for their execution in French clothes as his own sort of fashion statement. In this regard and others, Frederick's father was at least half mad. Um, so if you're particularly interested in this period and these two people, um, and it's written by um, James Gaines, who's a, a, an American um, journalist, it's, um, it's, it's really, really fun and you know, obviously informative. The next one is The House of Wittgenstein, A Family at War by Alexander War, who is the progeny of Evelyn and Oberon. So he obviously has his own um, uh, uh, dynastic issues to deal with. Um, I'm only um, that much through this. Um, I know a little bit about Paul Wittgenstein. I know a little, well, a little bit more about Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, but I had no idea that this family were so tragic and eccentric and spectacularly wealthy. Um, um, the father made enormous amounts of money. They are all profoundly musical. I mean, they are just all, you know, all of them. Not When Paul was a, uh, a renowned um, pianist, um, although he lost his um, arm in the First World War, but then... Um, Prokofiev and Ravel both wrote left-handed piano concertos for him. Um, obviously, Ludwig is one of the great genius of the 20th century, um, if not one of the most enigmatic and uh, elusive human beings ever, um, and a deeply troubled and tragic uh, man who, to my mind, brings out deep sympathies and a kind of empathy at his loneliness and desperateness to be to be a kind of nobody um he had sort of he had the kind of he, he struggled with the kind of the genius Tolstoy he struggled for I wanted to be to sort of dispossess himself of his own genius and and dispossess of himself of his of his self even um but not to give too much away I am um, of the six children eight children. I mean, three commit suicide um, under the age of 30 for very different reasons. Um, they're all terribly brittle and fragile um, and could barely be in the same room with each other. Um, uh, Alexander War, rather like his grandfather and his father, if that is in fact the lineage, is a little more cynical and snarky in Gaines is in, in, in the bark. But it's 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 thoroughly, thoroughly engrossing and um very good about about Austria in the First World War, um that whole kind of fin de siècle uh, moment um when Austria you know um, Vienna was full of you know extraordinary people whether it's was you know Schoenberg or um Schiele, um obviously the Wittgensteins or whatever, um, and then this country that was essentially the, you know, the hub of the Austro-Hungarian Empire then becomes this completely um, spent, tiny, nothing country in terms of world influence. Um, so that's that. Now my third book, um, which I've had a long time and I've tried to read a number of times, um, is enormous. 
uh, and it is not a work of popular history. It is called The Main Currents of Marxism by Leszek Kolakowski, um, who is a Polish intellectual. Um, I've read lots of books by um, Kolakowski um, because his essays on everything are superb and I recommend all of them. Um, he's fascinating because he was a very much committed communist, communist um, for a long time and then essentially left the party in the 1970s and the Communist Party of the, where he was living in the UK turned against him as, a, as though it was a kind of betrayal and he was a traitor um, and there was a huge intellectual furore as he, as he turned um, uh, and it was it was seen as it was seen you know, as as one of the great radical but clear thinking leading lights of um, post war socialist and communist thought. When he left the party, um, it was very meaningful, um, but he did so with you know um, dignity and made the case for in the intrinsic failure of the socialist stroke communist ideal. This, and quite frankly, I'm still only that way through it. Um, I think I've got that far before. It is, it, it is also written with, with great wit, um, but it essentially starts with Neoplatonists, moves then quite quickly into the 17th and 18th century, and then we're in the 19th century. But I just want to read the first few sentences of this because it's one, one of my favourite beginnings of all all pieces of intellectual, great intellectual heft. And this is a great work. He says, so this is the very opening, Karl Marx was a German philosopher. This does not sound a particularly enlightening statement, yet it is not so commonplace as it may at first appear. Jules, Jules Michelet, it will be recalled, used to begin his lectures on British history with the words, Messieurs, Longueterre est un île. It makes a good deal of difference whether we simply know that Britain is an island or whether we interpret its history in the light of that fact, which thus takes on a significance of its own. In his, and essentially what he's saying, and it may not sound, is that we must remember Marx was a German philosopher, that he wasn't a political agitator, that he wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a, um, a, a sort of a, a kind of political writer. He came from a tradition, essentially a Hegelian tradition, and that we must see his, his thought as part of a, of a intellectual tradition that, that that actually, to some degree, doesn't really think about how it's going to be applied in the world, and that is for others. And what he suggests, what what Kolakowski talks about very early on, is the idea that when we read Marx, in other way, when we read, you know, scripture, um, we we take what suits us. Um, because in a sense, script things like the scripture and um, Marxism. I think he gives a, he gives another. Um, uh, I can't remember what else it was. Um, has its own internal workings, and to to apply oneself to those internal workings is is to essentially have no. This is complicated. Is 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 essentially to become in a kind of involuted kind of uh, position of exposition and exegesis. Whereas to make it active, we've got to find something that we can then apply. And of course, we can't apply works of history in their completeness to other parts of time. And therefore, we're essentially searching for a, 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 a kind of nugget that feels resonant and then we pick it out and we apply it and run with it if we were if we are active in that and that's what m many people in the church do not theologians they, they they live in that kind of involuted world 
but people who want to radicalize or make changes that's what they do they find something that resonates um, and they say ultimately this is its key meaning and so and so we can't blame saint paul or marx for those things because of you know those outcomes um, because those outcomes are not those not those outcomes have not come from the all of a piece nature of the work actually most of that didn't make any sense um so um, forgive me um, um i do recommend it although i go to his essays first um but the other two really are just uh, fantastic so thank you <laughs>